Greetings everyone and welcome back to the John Audio Tech channel. Today I'm going to take a look at my do-it-yourself computer amplifier. I built this back in 2011 on my old channel, Vegematic or whatever I called it. If you've been watching my channel since back then, which a vast majority of you would not have because I didn't have that many subscribers or viewers back then. But it was in 2011 that I built this amplifier and it, you know, it's eight years later now and it works just fine. And uh, I'll show you that in a minute, but here's a, in relation to my test bench where the computer sits. Real quickly on the computer, it's just a uh, hodgepodge computer. That's an old case from almost 20 years ago. I put a motherboard in it. Back in 2012, it's a i3 2120 3.3 GHz, I believe. 8 gig of RAM. It's just uh, uh, internal graphics. I'm not into gaming or anything. I don't need a powerful computer, so I didn't spend a lot of money on it. Uh, probably next year I need to look at upgrading it. Switch to Windows 10, which I tried a couple times. I cannot get it to run on this machine. I'm using Windows 7 64-bit works fine. No problems at all. As for speakers, I'm using the Dayton Audio MK402s, if I remember the number correctly. did a video on those. I thought they were decent little speakers for the price. Um, I'm running a 15-inch subwoofer, passive. Certainly active is better, but I'm just running this passive sub sitting over here. See if I can get a view of it through all these wires. But yeah, it's a three cubic foot box. It's a sealed design. I really like it. Pretty happy with it. The only thing is, when I put the MK402s on, those speakers have very low sensitivity. I think they're 84 dB, 1 meter, 1 watt. So it's a little bit bassy because the subwoofer is much louder. But yeah, that's that. So back behind the screen here sits the, the amplifier. And a little bit dusty, but I'll get it unhooked. I built this thing, like I said, in 2011. I used an oak case, acrylic, black acrylic top there. And yeah, let me get this thing out of here so we can take a look at it. Run a power test and uh, uh, open it up and look inside and all that good stuff. Before I disconnect it, I probably should give you a music sample from YouTube's audio library here. Pretty much can't play any copyrighted music anymore because you can get a match content and lose your monetization. Even if it's very short, they're getting really tough with this. Oh, well, how about this corporate mellow groove? Okay, I guess that's good enough. Bass is kind of weird on that tune. It's kind of a hollowish, boxy sound. It's not really how the speaker sounds. But, oh well, I'm not going to search around for a perfect test tune here. So, let's move ahead and uh, take a look at the amplifier. Okay, here is the amplifier. It's a little bit dusty. But what we have is a volume control this is the power switch and this is not for headphones this is a front panel input jack and the switch that controls from the rear to the front and around back 
has speaker terminals, a little bit dusty. Probably should have cleaned it up first, but oh well. This came out of a JBL subwoofer that uh, blew up. The board blew up. It was my parents. Uh, the board burned so bad it was just not repairable. It burned up a bunch of traces and everything. And they wanted a bunch of money to repair the thing to get another board. So just parted out the sub for parts. And these were the original speaker input jacks on the back. Uh, of course, the RCA. And uh, that's an XLR connector for power. And these are the rail indicator LEDs. So yeah, it has an external power supply. I was thinking, uh, you know, this be light and portable, and I could take it out and use it on batteries or something. So I, that's why it went with the external power supply. But I kind of like the design. It's a retro type look to it. Aluminum bottom there. So let's pop the top and take a look inside. Okay, I removed the black acrylic top and we're in. And yes, it's based on the TDA 2050. Tried to lay it out as nicely as I could on the perf board. Used star grounding and everything. Uh, short paths. Uh, decoupling caps close to the ICs. Have some protection fuses and can't see them under the wire there, but there's a couple of anti-parallel diodes which protects just in case the amplifier is connected to the wrong polarity. It is a dual rail type amplifier, so it requires a three wire DC supply. I'm not using any isolators or insulators on the heat sink here, so the chips are connected directly to the heat sink. So the negative rail is on the heat sink. However, it's only 20 volts on the negative rail. There's a uh, plus 20 and minus 20 uh, volt rail on this amplifier with the power supply that I'm using. And um, I'm using nylon bolts there to keep that rail off of the bottom. So just the heat sink. And the reason for doing that is the best heat dissipation from these small chips, large heat sink. A little bit overboard, I think. I could have made it isolated. It'd still be fine. But uh, anyway, to keep this thing from wiggling, I attach the top. So if you're moving around, these aren't, you know, this heat sink is nice and solid in place. It's not going to stress the uh, legs on the chip. Uh, it's uh, a little bit messy there with all the wiring up front. But I kept the input wiring over here. This is the power supply and the output leads. And not sure what else to say about this. Used a very large heat sink, as you see. Uh, no heat sink is too large, you know when keeping electronics cool. So here's a look inside its companion power supply. It has, I think it's called an IEC connector, has a fuse. I have a noise filter cap across the line here. It's not a safety cap, but it is a 1200 volt rated cap. So I think we're okay there. Notice there are two transformers instead of one. I couldn't find the transformer I wanted at the time, so I just bought two of these. I was at Parts Express, and they were out of one transformer. These are 12 volts. It was supposed to be 5 amp each. 12.6 volt, 5 amp secondaries. But the cores are kind of small for that. So, you know, I think they're overrating, and I have a Radio Shack transformer, old one, and it's rated 5 amps, 12.6 volts, and it, it's a lot larger. So I would say these are actually uh, about 50 volt amps, so they're 
12 volt 4 amps, which is fine. And you see some weird stuff going on here. I actually wound on some extra turns here. I used this mylar here taped on it so the turns wouldn't scrape up against the core. I wanted a little bit more voltage, but you know, I couldn't find, like, I wanted 14 volt transformers instead of 12.6. Couldn't find anything like that, so I just wound on some extra turns on each side. So between them is the center tap, and I, on the outer tap I wound on the extra turns on both sides. So that brings the voltage up a little higher for what I wanted. Normally with a 25.2 volt center tap transformer I get around 15 watts out of the uh, TDA-70, TDA-2050 but I wanted a little bit more power. I wanted to use these with 4 ohm loads. So I uh, wanted to bring it up more like 20 watts per channel. So that's why I did this. I don't really want to push it any harder. You could push the chips harder, but I'm not into pushing stuff. I like reliability. So I, I just wanted to push the power up a little bit. So doing this is, so that's the reason for doing that. And uh, you see the wires kind of doubled up here. That's because there wasn't enough room for a heavier wire to slide it through here, you know, between the core and the other winding. So I just doubled up thinner wire to get my current up. So we have the rectifiers, 10,000 microfarad cap on each rail, a film cap down there, and discharge resistors. So, you know, if this thing's unhooked from anything and you turn it on, it'll discharge these caps when you disconnect it so there won't be a remaining charge. And we have the nice bright blue power LED. And uh, let me measure the voltage on this thing. This is the XLR connector supposed to be around 20 volts per rail. Okay, got some power to it. And guess who came up on the bench while I was looking for a cord to plug it in? It's the Snickers! Hey, Snick. How you doing, Snick? Okay, so it is running just shy of 40 volts, so a little bit under 20 volts per rail. Eh, that'll do just fine. So what I'm going to do now is hook this up to the amplifier and do some power measurements. I have to be careful when this is open. It's not double insulated. You know, those are live. I put some mylar over them to help, you know, perfect protect from accidental touching and it is grounded but yeah I just built it for me it's not double insulated or worthy of a uh, underwriters laboratory certification or whatever but like I say just built it for myself okay I got the amplifier hooked up to the non-inductive 4 ohm loads both channels driven Maximum clean power before distortion. Have the audio player plugged directly in. I don't need the preamp on this test because the amplifier has its own level control. So let me set you up on the scope here. I'm only going to test at 4 ohm loads. So I'll go ahead and adjust. Crank this thing up. There's clipping. You see it bounces around a little bit. That's because of the uh, AC waveform. And it's not a regulated supply like I normally use. But what I want to do is adjust it just so that clipping is gone. Getting nice waveform, no oscillations that I see so the layout seems pretty good 
Uh, so we're running at 8.82 volts. So I'll find my calculator here and punch the numbers in. So we had 8.82 volts squared divided by 4 ohms. And we're getting 19.448, so just about 19 and a half watts. A little shy of the 20 watts per channel I wanted, but eh, I don't care. Probably could have wound a couple extra turns on those transformers to get me what I wanted, but that's fine. Now I'm curious, if I just measure one channel, how much more would the power be? You know, that would draw less current from the power supply and its voltage wouldn't drop as much. So let's see what the actual power would be using only one channel from the amplifier. Let's set that back there. Turn the thing back on. Okay, disconnected one of the channels, and you can see I can turn that up a lot higher than before, since we're not drawing as much power off. Now we're at 9.92 volts. Wow, did that go up. 9.92 squared divided by 4, 24.6 watts. I'll turn that off. I don't want these resistors getting real hot and burning my uh, bench here. So yeah, you can see how uh, about half the current from the supply doesn't draw its voltage down as much and you get more power from that one operating channel of the amplifier. Okay, I'm going to plug the uh, channel back Okay, I'll plug the uh, other signal back into the other channel, and we'll get some distortion measurements. Okay, here is distortion. Uh, crank this thing up. Oh, there's clipping. Turn that out of clipping. So, if you're not familiar with my measurements, this is the 1 kilohertz fundamental. This is the 1% signal, 4.5 kilohertz or marker, pilot signal, whatever you want to call it. I just use that to reference the other harmonic notches. And, well, I really don't see anything. It's a pretty clean amplifier. This is, the, this is a distortion at 20 hertz, and there's really nothing here. Now keep in mind, my oscilloscope can only measure down to about 0.2%. It's an 8-bit scope. Figuring in oversampling, I can see about 0.2%. So it's not really a hi-fi measurement device. But it's good enough to tell me that there's no issues with this amplifier where it's putting out high distortion that would be audible. Now I'm at 10 kilohertz and it's just noise floor, no real distortion issues with this amplifier. Okay, this is the 10 to 100 hertz sweep, testing the frequency response. We're at 20 hertz now and the waveform should be at this upper and this lower graticule there. And it, it's pretty close. I mean, probably a fraction of a hertz, or I mean a dB off. I did use a little smaller input coupling capacitors, but that's okay. This is the 20 to 20 kilohertz sweep. Notice that it does go a bit higher than the graticule. That's because my music player, for some reason, as it goes through the uh, frequency band, it, the signal breathes. I tested it with the music player, 
and it's just something it always did so that's normal and when it does get to 20 it will start to roll off again that's due to the music player and it rolls off a bit and resets so the frequency response is pretty flat with this amp no problem at all there okay as my final test I'm kinda wonder how much power this amplifier draws from the wall uh, we're just, that's about my line voltage so we're good there so set it for watts these LCD screens they just don't show up worth a crap unless you have the light at the right angle okay so this is the power supply turned on with the amplifier turned off so it draws about 8 watts okay this is with the amplifier turned on sitting idle now we're up to 12.4 so the amplifier sitting idle doesn't draw that much okay here is the amplifier at full output before clipping let's see right there's clipping I'm going to turn it out of clipping so wow just to get 40 watts a little less than 40 watts of clean output we need almost 90 watts so let me turn it up okay now we're into clipping I'd say I don't know how what percentage that would be I'd have to look at the FFT but you know that's taking 101 watts of wall power just for that but let me turn that off so the little resistors don't get sizzling hot but yeah that's pretty interesting now wait a minute one more thing here turn that back on let's see what what's the volt amp draw so it's drawing 120 volt amps almost 119 volt amps at that level so I'll turn that off so that's the amp idle about 20 watts I'm sorry volt amps 19 volt amps and the supply alone is about 15 volt amps okay so that was interesting and that is my little computer amplifier system I'm quite happy with it and like I say I uh, built it a while ago and it's worked flawlessly I never really turn it up very loud because it's near field listening I don't need it real loud but let me crank it up with some bass here with that subwoofer give you an idea what that sounds like of course the I don't think my camera is gonna pick up the deep bass but I'll see what I can do okay I'll play this bass wave as I call it here's the file bass wave 2 and I'll put a link in the description I have a bunch of test files that you can download including that one I use on the oscilloscope with the marker frequency or uh, pilot signal as I call it but anyhow when I play this thing you know it modulates it the signal oscillates up and down from 25 to 50 Hertz goes up and down I don't know if this camera will pick up the fundamental but you're gonna hear a lot of things vibrating in the room from the subwoofer so here we go Wow, that is bass. I can stand over there and just 
barely put my teeth together and they actual actually <laughs> make my teeth rattle I can feel them vibrate together it's kind of wild that's a lot of bass but you know with a decent subwoofer you can get a lot of bass for not a lot of power it's only an 8 ohm subwoofer so it's probably only getting about 12 watts per channel and I set it so it's not clipping or anything so yeah it's a pretty decent amount of bass from that well that'll wrap it up thanks for watching and we'll catch you on the next one.